Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and I'm very excited tonight uh, for tonight's talk called Advanced Diagnostic and Treatment for Progressive Keratoconus. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind all the attendees, if you have any questions, please put them into um, above the chat box as a place for questions, and we'll be happy to spend some time afterwards answering as many as we can. Um, Tonight's speaker, Dr. Stephen Greenstein, is a cornea refractive surgeon at the Cornea and Laser Eye and the CELEI Center for Keratoconus. It's a subspecialty clinic dedicated to the research and treatment of keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's published multiple peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and presented at scientific meetings on his keratoconus research, and is specifically was involved in the initial research for the FDA trial on collagen cross-linking. Dr. Greenstein did his ophthalmology residency training at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School and his cornea refractive and external disease fellowship at Massachusetts Eye and Ear at Harvard Medical School. During his fellowship, Dr. Greenstein was honored with the prestigious HEAT Award for ophthalmology, the HEAT Ophthalmology Fellow Award. With no further ado, I am really excited to hear our talk tonight. Dr. Stephen Greenstein, welcome. Thanks, Bill. Um, it is really exciting uh, to be uh, here tonight. I want to thank uh, Oculus for uh, allowing me to uh, present uh, tonight. Um, keratoconus and treatment of keratoconus is a rapidly uh, evolving uh, field, so it's always exciting to come back and talk about the advancements in both a diagnostic and diagnostics and treatment of this disease. These are uh, my financial disclosures. They all do have some relevance to uh, the talk tonight. So as we all know, uh, keratoconus is a progressive corneal disease. It's a, a focal thinning of the cornea. And in that area of thinning, there's a biomechanical weakening of the cornea. This biomechanical weakening results in steepening and irregularity of the cornea, which distorts corneal optics. And modern keratoconus management really breaks down now into three categories. The first being stability. So primarily the most important thing is to stabilize the cornea and prevent the cornea from becoming uh, steeper and more irregular. And the only treatment that we have currently available to do this is corneal cross-linking. There's been significant advancement in the second portion, which is our surgical ability to improve patients' corneal topography, uh, particularly with corneal inlays and with topography-guided PRK, both of which I'm going to touch on uh, this evening. And then finally, once we've stabilized the cornea, once we've improved corneal topography, uh, it then becomes our ultimate goal to improve patients' vision. Uh, and we are increasingly able to improve patients' vision in glasses. Of course, contact lenses are still the mainstay of our vision improvement for our keratoconic patients. And there are other modalities, which we'll touch on as well, uh, which can improve patients' vision. But it all starts uh, at the diagnostic level. If we can't diagnose keratoconus early, uh, then we can't stabilize the cornea and we can't treat it early. And as we all know, the slit lamp signs of keratoconus really manifest themselves very, very late in the game. So both striae or apical scarring, particularly high drops uh, or the Munson sign are, are really much later progression of the disease. And once you've reached these signs, uh, some of our treatment options have become more limited. So these are really already, when you're seeing keratoconus at the slit lamp, you know that you're looking at more advanced disease. So the emphasis has to be on diagnosing keratoconus early and then being able to follow keratoconus to determine whether or not the cornea is changing, whether or not there's progression, and then what would be the best treatment option uh, for each individual patient. And of course, our mainstay for diagnosis is uh, corneal topography and really now corneal tomography. Uh, placido imaging, which gives us anterior curvature measurements, and then really shine flug imaging or OCT, which gives us shape uh, of, of the cornea, both the anterior surface, the posterior surface, and the thickness of the cornea. So when it comes to corneal topography, and we're looking at placido images on the right, 
it's pretty obvious when you're looking at a normal cornea versus a very severe keratoconic cornea, with the Myers being significantly more irregular in the keratoconic cornea. But already when you're seeing Myers that are this irregular, it's similar to the slit lamp, where you're looking at more advanced disease. As we look at corneal uh, curvature and anterior curvature measurements of more mild disease, it's really important to be able to determine certain metrics that we can then use to determine how irregular the cornea is that we're looking at. So we look at things like keratometry, the mean keratometry. We look at measurements like the maximum keratometry, the steepest area of the cornea, the inferior and superior difference, so the difference in curvature between the uh, superior portion of the cornea and the inferior portion of the cornea. And then if we look at the axis of astigmatism and then the skew or deviation of that uh, inferior steepening, uh, we can also determine how irregular the anterior curvature is. And we've developed certain metrics such as steepness greater than 47 diopters or an inferior superior difference that's greater than 1.4 diopters, skew deviations that are greater than 20 degrees with a diopter and a half of cylinder to sort of flag for us when we might be looking at a cornea that's more irregular and we need to be concerned that we're looking at keratoconus. But as I said, really the gold standard now is corneal tomography. It's uh, to look at the entire shape of the cornea. It's to look at the anterior surface, the posterior surface, and the thickness. And by uh, identifying the anterior surface, either through shine fluke imaging or OCT, we can then look at that surface compared to a best fit sphere or some regular uh, um, baseline uh, measurement. And then we can get our elevation uh, data from that. We can get full thickness maps, not just at one point of the cornea, but thickness maps along the entire cornea. And from all of that, we can still derive curvature maps uh, similar to what we can with placido imaging. So again, I think if you look at this uh, tomography image, it'd be very obvious that we're looking at keratoconus here, and we see that the anterior curvature, uh, we have an irregular inferior steepening, very classic for keratoconus. This corresponds to anterior elevation, particularly an island of anterior elevation, an island of posterior elevation, and then the corneal thickness, the thinnest area is really localized to those areas of elevation and steepening, which is very classic for keratoconus. But where tomography really shines is when you're looking at more borderline cases, and particularly in cases where you might be considering refractive surgery. So in this case, we can see that there is inferior steepening of the cornea, um, not probably enough to meet any of our criteria to say this is a definitively irregular cornea or definitively keratoconic. There's a mild anterior elevation, a mild posterior elevation, and maybe some mild thinning in that area, but if it is, it's, it's very, very mild. So this is a very borderline case, but enough that it might flag uh, for someone not to do uh, LASIK, for example, in, in this case, and to maybe follow this patient more closely to determine whether there might be any progression uh, and development of full keratoconus. But now we can go even further than that, and we have an analyses that can be done around certain points of the cornea and the whole cornea itself based off of the uh, anterior and posterior uh, uh, surfaces as well as the thickness of the cornea, which can then tell us how irregular the cornea is that we're looking at compared to the general population. So one of these analyses is the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced dictation display. And, and this really tells you how irregular the cornea is that you're looking at um, compared to uh, a regular cornea. It's not necessarily diagnostic of keratoconus itself, but it definitely would flag irregularity where you would be concerned. So in our case of a definitive keratoconus, you can see that we generate through a regression analysis this uh, D value which flags in red, which means that it's two standard deviations outside of the norm. And this is definitely a very irregular cornea, which we already knew. But looking at our more borderline case, again, this affirms that we are not looking at a normal cornea, that we are, we're correct in our suspicion that at least this cornea is borderline and maybe has a form first keratoconus. Uh, 
and it flags under the D value of yellow, which again is one standard deviation outside of normal. Um, so we would know that this patient needs to be followed and uh, would potentially uh, can go on to develop a keratoconus. And then finally, uh, an area that we are very interested in and we're uh, beginning to conduct uh, some research trials is in genetic testing for keratoconus. There is now a commercially available a genetic test uh, through Avigen, uh, which is a cheek swab, and uh, it looks at multiple uh, genetics uh, markers for keratoconus, and then it generates a risk score uh, based on your genetics uh, to determine how at risk you are of developing keratoconus uh, down the road. And it really divides these into uh, cases of low risk, moderate risk, and high risk, um, and this can be uh, very helpful potentially down the road uh, to knowing how to screen patients and how often to screen them uh, for keratoconus. So we're very commonly asked in our clinic of patients who have keratoconus and have kids who have keratoconus, well, when should I bring them in or how often should they be screened? Um, and we've been telling patients generally that uh, we usually start to screen patients somewhere around uh, the age of 10 to 12. Uh, with our uh, tomography in the office. But if so certain patients, if their kids uh, were told they have higher levels of astigmatism at younger ages or really uh, any significant refraction at all, uh, we will screen them even younger. But now we have the potential to be able to uh, screen uh, patients even younger uh, and really give parents an assessment of where their child may fall uh, in terms of uh, their risk of developing keratoconus. And the two particular areas of interest that we're researching here, and we're just getting started in this, is both looking at uh, families. So we are going to be uh, taking uh, genetic testing of children of patients who have keratoconus and then monitoring them uh, over time to determine how the risk scores do correlate to uh, changes down the road. And potentially where this may fall into use for refractive surgery, which is we are uh, looking at patients who have had uh, already diagnosed ectasia and what were their uh, risk scores uh, and potentially trying to compare it to their preoperative uh, measurements to uh, see whether or not this test can be used uh, in a refractive surgery screening uh, as well. So this is a really exciting area uh, for keratoconus diagnosis and earlier keratoconus diagnosis, uh, which uh, we are just getting started in. And then once you have diagnosed keratoconus, uh, we need to be able to obviously communicate about the level of disease that we're seeing and whether or not patients are changing. And for a long time, we really had very few classification schemes for keratoconus, um, and they were based in very general metrics. So the most common uh, scheme used was the amsler krumek uh, keratoconus uh, classification. And really, if we look at these classification scheme, we can see that it's based in mean keratometry, which frequently uh, can miss uh, early keratoconus. Uh, we've looked at uh, our own population of uh, keratometry values in keratoconus, and it's not until maximum keratometry is greater than 55 diopters or even 60 diopters uh, that you'll see uh, mean keratometries that are steeper than 48 diopters. So mean keratometry is really only correlated to, se to severe keratoconus um, and really has very little correlation to mild or moderate cases. And then uh, keratoconus can be staged based off of a refraction, particularly myopia or astigmatism. But again, uh, in our own population, when we've looked at our keratoconus patients, we have uh, almost an equal amount of patients who will have a uh, mixed astigmatism, especially as the disease becomes more severe. Uh, as have a myopic uh, astigmatism. And so this is a very limited way of classifying keratoconus. And when we look at the corneal thickness measurements, most of these early thickness measurements were based off of one point ultrasound measurements, which can be very variable depending on where you're taking them on the cornea. Uh, 
But now, once again, we can really start to drill down on staging keratoconus uh, based off of our tomography images. And, if, and this can be done with the ABCD staging. So the ABCD staging looks at the uh, three millimeter zone around the thinnest point. And that is the area of most concern in keratoconus. That is the weakest portion of the keratoconic cornea. And so this is the area we would expect to see the earliest uh, progression and the earliest change. And so the A, B, and C look at the anterior, the back, or posterior surface uh, curvature and the corneal thickness. And then you can add in your vision measurements uh, to stage uh, the disease. And if we look at our advanced case, once again, we can now develop staging for all the different portions of this patient's keratoconus. There's stage four, in curvature of the anterior and posterior surface, uh, but they're not that thin. They're stage one in corneal thickness, and then you can add in the uh, vision correction if you want uh, from your clinic. But this allows us to really communicate uh, with one another in terms of what we're seeing and what we're looking at and how things are changing in a very precise way. If we look at a more mild case, this is uh, showing that this is a stage two of posterior keratoconus, meaning most of the changes on the posterior surface and then again, at our borderline case, we don't uh, yet, or in stage zero of anterior, posterior, and thickness. Um, and again, this is maybe a case of form first keratoconus in some uh, a patient that needs to be watched. We can then take that data, the area around the thinnest point, and th use through a separate regression analysis, we can compare it uh, to previous visits to see whether or not the cornea is changing and by how much. And again, it's very helpful because in this type of display, we can actually take a look at how this compares to a similar keratoconic population, which has been analyzed. And this is the Bellin, uh, from Dr. Bellin, ABCD progression display. Again, the visual acuity data has to be entered in separately, but the uh, anterior, posterior, and corneal thickness data uh, all, all are generated uh, from the Pentacam. And so if we look at this case here, uh, as you can see, the uh, Pentagram and the display will show you an 80% and a 95% confidence interval in green, which is a normal population, but then in red, which is a keratoconic population. So specifically how a keratoconic uh, cornea would change uh, over time. And if your exam compared to whatever exam you wanna choose, in this case, the patient's initial exam, uh, changes by enough that it passes the 95% confidence interval, you can be uh, pretty reassured that what you're looking at is a definitive progression uh, for that patient. And you can even add in when you've done cross-linking treatment to kind of look how the cornea has potentially changed over time. So here's an example of how we use it. Uh, the first case is somewhat more obvious. This was actually a patient uh, who was uh, 17 years old who had saw us for an initial visit and did not uh, follow up uh, for their cross-linking until six months later. And if you look here, it, and you just look at the anterior curvature maps in the top left, you'd be pretty clear that this patient probably had progression. And if we look at their K-max, we can see that there was a significant steepening of K-max. And then we look at some of our other metrics, like the axial curvature. So the curvature of the front of the cornea has definitely become steeper. We look at the front elevation, which has definitely become more elevated. We look at the back elevation, which has also become more elevated. And then we look at the thickness, which has become thinner, and combine that with a steeper maximum keratometry. And we're pretty clear that this patient has progressed. If we put that into the Bellin ABCD progression display, you can see how that then lines up and it's a really nice and easy way to run through essentially what I just did by looking at four different maps and four different compare to maps on one screen. We can look and see that the anterior surface has, the curvature has become steeper, the posterior surface has become steeper, and the cornea has become thinner. And when we compare this to the uh, keratoconic population uh, in the database, there we're 95% confident that all of this progression uh, meets the criteria of progression, and this patient absolutely needs to move forward with cross -linking.
But then uh, we can look at a uh, more mild a case and it's less clear about whether or not we need to treat this patient. So here was a patient who had come back again, also about six months later. And if we just looked at the K-max values here, we would say this patient was stable. There has been very little progression, uh, if any, just looking at the anterior curvature map. So again, running through kind of the uh, metrics of the curvature, elevation, and thickness, here we don't really see any significant steepening, maybe a little bit in the center, but hard to tell from this map. Anteriorly, uh, there's no clear elevation. We then look uh, posteriorly, maybe we're seeing a little bit of elevation right at the center uh, of the island, reading as 31 microns to 36 microns, but hard to know exactly what to make of that change. There's no uh, significant corneal thinning, and as we saw, there was no significant change in k mats. So really we're left to sort of now wonder or think to ourselves, well, how much does this posterior elevation matter? Is it just kind of noise in the system or is that a real change? Well, again, the ABCD uh, display can be very helpful here. We look and we see that anteriorly, as we saw, there really hasn't been much change and nothing meets uh, the uh, confidence interval of progression. We look at the thickness where we also saw there was not much change. And again, the same thing, uh, nothing really meets the uh, confidence level of progression. But that small change, what looked like a small change in the uh, posterior surface, when you really look and hone in on the thinnest point and the three millimeters around it, we can see that the posterior curvature has steepened. And when we compare that to a keratoconic population, it's actually steepened pretty significantly. And this is a patient who we would recommend doing early cross-linking for and hopefully preventing any uh, long-term visual sequelae or more irregularity in their cornea as time went on. So where we may have at one point been left sort of wondering, is this true progression? Maybe we would have told a patient like that to come back in another two to three months and see whether or not there's uh, still change. We can look at a, a regression analysis like the ABCD display and be more confident in our clinical decisions that this patient needs an earlier cross-linking and hopefully uh, prevent uh, any further uh, degradation of their vision down the road. And the last thing which has been added to the uh, ABCD uh, display, which is very helpful, is a post-cross-linking analysis. So uh, what we do know is that uh, monitoring keratoconic patients doesn't change because you've done cross-linking. We still have to follow these patients and make sure that they don't change over time. So in this case, we're looking at a case where compared to 2017 to 2019, so two years of change, there was a nice amount of flattening from cross-linking. So we like to see this. But as we go visit to visit, uh, what we really want to know is how is this changing uh, compared to the visit before? And so now we can compare our patient not only to a normal population and not only to a general keratoconic population, but we can actually compare our patient to a, a post-cross-linking population. And that's what you can see in blue. And what this does is changes the baseline analysis to be one year after their cross-linking was done or the soonest visit that meets uh, the one-year criteria and then compares all of the subsequent visits uh, to that uh, one-year uh, post-op visit. And you can see whether or not the curvature is continuing to flatten or steepen and whether that steepening might require additional cross-linking. So in this case, we saw good flattening and you can be reassured looking at the ABCD display that you are seeing flattening on the anterior surface, the posterior surface, um, and the thickness becomes harder to uh, evaluate after cross-linking. Um, we had published initially uh, that uh, you do see a little bit of thinning uh, after epi off cross-linking is performed. Um, it may be real, it may just be artifact from some of the demarcation lines that uh, you see after cross-linking. So the thinning measurements are still a little bit hard to analyze uh, after cross-linking, but the curvature uh, is very, very helpful. So once uh, we know uh, about how to follow a patient and see whether or not they're progressing, 
uh, we can then now use this data. We can use the uh, tomography data that we have. We can use the comparative maps that we have to really make our clinical decisions. And this has helped us immensely uh, in moving forward in modern keratoconus management. So as we talked about at the beginning, the primary treatment that a patient with progressive keratoconus uh, requires is to stabilize their cornea with corneal crosslinking. And as we all know, crosslinking was FDA approved in 2016, the epithelial off version, uh, with its indications for keratoconus, progressive keratoconus in patients that were older than uh, 14 years old, and for corneal ectasia after refractive surgery. And what we saw in our outcomes of topography and uh, visual acuity was that there was mild improvement uh, in both topography and visual acuity one year after crosslinking. So we saw that the cornea flattened on average by about a diopter and a half after crosslinking. Keratoconus indices uh, on the pentacam significantly improved one year after crosslinking. And visual acuity, both uncorrected and best corrected improved by about one line, uncorrected a little bit more than one line, uh, best spectacle corrected a little bit less than one line. And we saw a general improvement of higher order aberrations after crosslinking, but all of this improvement was mild. What we really wanted to know was how stable is the cornea going to be over the long term? And so we uh, did a, a study with Glaucos uh, in the last year, looking at having our patients who we treated in the original uh, US uh, pivotal trial come back in, and now they were either 10 years or longer after crosslinking, to determine how stable their treatments had been over time. And so we were able to uh, enroll 30 eyes into the trial. 15 had keratoconus and 15 had acacia after refractive surgery. These were 30 eyes of 16 patients some of whom had undergone some other subsequent surgery uh, since uh, their original cross-linking treatment. But in general, what we saw was very uh, remarkable stability, particularly in the keratoconic patients uh, 10 years after cross-linking. And when we looked at best spectacle corrected visual acuity, what we saw was that overall, 86% of the patients who were treated with cross-linking remained uh, stable with their best corrected uh, visual acuity 10 years after crosslinking. And we define worsening as worsening of two or more logmar lines. 100% of the keratoconic patients remain stable, and about 70, 71% of the ectasia patients uh, remain stable. Then we looked at corneal topography, and we defined progression as two diopters of steepening of K-max. And again, the numbers were pretty similar. About 76% uh, of the uh, patients in the entire study remained stable within two diopters of their original treatment. 86% of the keratoconic patients and about two thirds of the ectasia patients. And finally, we looked at the ABCD progression display and we only here looked at the anterior and posterior surface uh, because, again, the thickness is a little bit harder to measure after crosslinking. And we define progression as passing the 95% confidence interval of progression in the anterior and posterior surface. And we found that overall, 79.3% of all the patients uh, treated remain stable uh, after 10 years after crosslinking. Uh, over 90% of the keratoconic patients remain stable, and again, just under two-thirds of the ectasia patients remain stable. So our take-home from this study uh, was that although it's a small group of eyes, um, it does corroborate with uh, much of the European data that we had, which is that uh, cross-linking is very, very stable uh, over the de first decade uh, after the treatment is performed. Uh, what was interesting in the study was that it is particularly stable in the patients with keratoconus, and definitely less so in the patients who have had refractive surgery. So it's important to counsel your patients who are being treated for ectasia after refractive surgery, that although we still recommend that they do move forward with crosslinking, and the majority of them will remain stable over uh, the first decade, uh, there is a significant minority of them that will still progress, and their follow-up is critical even after the treatment is done. 
So now that we know that uh, cross-linking stabilizes the cornea, and generally we're comfortable with the fact that it stabilizes the cornea over the long term, this has really changed our ability to offer patients topography improving procedures uh, to hopefully correct their uh, spectacle correction, sometimes their uncorrected vision, uh, and their contact lens uh, fittings. And we have inlays, topography guided PRK, a conductive keratoplasty, and of course still uh, lamellar or full uh, thickness uh, keratoplasty, uh, which can all improve patients' topography uh, after uh, they've had cross-linking done. Tonight, I want to particularly focus on two of these modalities, which has had the most advancement recently, which is topography guided PRK and the area that we're really excited about, which is our advancement in uh, corneal inlays in particular. So topography guided surgery in the US was FDA approved for topography guided LASIK in 2016. A topography guided PRK is an off, PRK in general is an off label use of uh, the device, and uh, topography guided PRK in keratoconus is off label as well. And as most people know, uh, what we're doing with topography guided laser in general is we're taking placido images uh, of a patient's cornea. From those images, we're generating a, a treatment plan with the laser to generate an ablation profile, which will flatten particularly over the steeper areas of the cornea, and then steepen some of the flatter areas of the cornea uh, to create a more regular corneal contour. And so what you see on the right is pretty typical for a more moderate treatment that the laser would want to uh, achieve, which is that it's going to flatten in purple directly over the cone, usually infratemporally, and then you'll see a pretty classic arc up top, which is trying to steepen uh, the flatter portion of the cornea and create a more regular surface. Now, these ablation profiles can be uh, very, very uh, significant, uh, where the laser calls for large amounts of ablation in corneas that are already fairly thin, um, and we have uh, used a transepithelial approach in many of these cases uh, to be able to still use these profiles effectively without thinning the cornea nearly as much. And some of our retrospective data that we looked at in our own clinic uh, showed that we were improving uncorrected visual acuity uh, by about uh, three lines and best spectacle corrected visual acuity by about a line and a half, um, although that didn't uh, quite reach statistical significance uh, when we looked at the retrospective data. Um, we're improving uncorrected visual acuity from about 2200, these were logmar lines, to just better than 2100. And then in the best corrected visual acuity, 2040 to almost 2025. So that, that can be a pretty uh, impressive improvement for a patient to go from being 2040 in their glasses to being close to 2025 in their glasses. They really will notice that difference and it makes a huge difference in their life to be able to wear glasses uh, more effectively. We found that on average, we were flattening the cornea by about 4.7 diopters, and we were uh, thinning the cornea by just under 40 microns. And if we look at the tomography maps below, uh, what you can see in the anterior curvature here is that uh, the this is a moderate keratoconic patient with a pretty a steep inferior cone and a big inferior superior difference. It's very, he's very flat uh, superiorly, he's very thin inferiorly. And when we performed a transepithelial uh, eczema laser ablation, you can see how much uh, the profound flattening we can get uh, using the laser with some uh, steepening up top. And if you look in the center at his post-op uh, result, you can see how much more regular the curvature is in the center of this cornea. And this is why these patients have such profound visual improvement. And many of these patients can actually uh, wear uh, soft contact lenses uh, after this procedure is performed. The other area that I wanted to touch on uh, this evening uh, is corneal tissue inlays. And uh, this has been a huge improvement in our ability to treat a much more diverse uh, and much more severe 
a group of keratoconic patients with uh, corneal inlays. And corneal tissue inlays offer us uh, a bunch of uh, advantages, uh, including improved biocompatibility to a synthetic inlay. They can treat both mild and very severe disease. And one of the uh, greatest uses for it is that we can use them in thinner corneas, whereas that was a significant limitation to using synthetic inlays uh, in the past. And there are many different uh, types of corneal tissue inlays. Uh, tonight, I'm going to focus on uh, corneal tissue ring segments, which essentially right now come in three forms, uh, some of which are uh, commercially available already and some hopefully will be available uh, soon. And that's the uh, CARES, the CARE Natural, and CTAC, which we are working on uh, in our office. So CARES and CARE Natural uh, are both uh, ring segments that are cut uh, manually uh, with specialized uh, tree finds and punches. Um, and they're very similarly designed to uh, intact segments uh, with similar uh, arc lengths. And the CARES uh, ring segment is developed from fresh tissue. The CARE natural segment is developed from preserved tissue. In our office, we've been working on something that we have called the CTAC segment, or the Customized Tissue Addition for Keratoconus Inlay, uh, which also uses a preserved tissue, which we've been uh, working on with in conjunction with corneogen, a vision graft tissue, which is gamma uh, irradiated. Um, and this preserved tissue is shelf-stable, so it can be shipped and uh, used uh, within uh, the course of uh, many uh, months. And it also does have an additional rigidity to it compared to fresh tissue, which may have some biomechanical advantages uh, to the way that we use it in the keratoconic cornea. But what's key about these inlays is our ability to customize them with the femtosecond laser. So we can now customize the thickness of these inlays, we can customize the length of these inlays, and we can customize the width of these inlays uh, to each individual cornea that we're treating. And so our limitations when it came to synthetic inlays were uh, that the cornea, and one of the biggest limitations, as I said before, was that the cornea really needed to be an appropriate thickness. If the cornea was too thin, we were uh, concerned that the synthetic inlay would uh, might extrude, um, in which case we would have to remove the inlay. And, and we've done some retrospective looks at our intact segments that we've placed in, in over a thousand corneas. And we found that generally just over 6% of those uh, inlays did have to be removed at some point after they were placed. And uh, just over half of them were removed because of some sort of optical complication. Either the vision got worse or uh, patients were complaining, complaining of some additional glare or halo um, and we removed it for that reason. But just under half of those were removed for certain medical complications, either infection or more commonly, uh, an extrusion. So we stay away from placing these segments in thinner corneas. But the uh, portion that's also uh, sometimes uh, not as look looked at is that the cone location and the size of the cone uh, and how steep the cone is it plays a big role in how effective the synthetic inlays can be. Because if you have a cone that is very large or a cone that isn't sitting close to where you place the inlay, then you might not be getting the uh, ring segment around the entire steep area or close enough to the area of steepening to induce a flattening that is effective in creating a more regular topography. And if the cornea is too steep and you use the thickest inlay and you don't get enough flattening, then you really haven't created enough of an effect for a patient to notice much of a difference. The tissue inlays can be uh, customized for thinner corneas. We can customize them to fit right around a cone, and we can customize them to induce more flattening in the cornea than we ever could before. And I think these pictures here really uh, summarize why we're so excited about these tissue inlays. 
if you look at the picture in the top left, you're looking at a fairly severe case of keratoconus. This patient has a maximum keratometry somewhere around 74 diopters. And uh, when we placed the CTAC segment, if you placed a synthetic inlay like an intact segment, you would get some flattening around a cornea like this, um, but probably not enough to have a meaningful effect. But when we place a CTAC segment around a uh, cone uh, like this, you can see the profound effect that this segment has. We're seeing flattening centrally of about 20 diopters. This is significantly more than we would see with any uh, inlay that has been used in the past. And you can see in the post-op image how regular the astigmatism becomes, how much flatter the cornea is centrally, and how much regular, how much more regular the cornea appears. And what's really exciting is if you look at then the maps below. Now we're looking at a case which is much more mild. Uh, this case has uh, a maximum keratometry of probably around 55 diopters. The cone is much smaller, um, located fairly similarly. And here we use a smaller, thinner segment wrapped right around the cone. And in this case, we only induced about five diopters, 4.7 diopters of flattening, which was exactly what we needed. And once again, you can see that there's a more regular and flatter central cornea. And I think the most striking thing when you look at this, these uh, pictures is looking at the post-op images at the top and at the bottom and how strikingly similar they are, even though the severity of the disease in these two patients is so different. Here's an image of how these CTACs uh, look immediately post-op. So this is the same patient where you can see how steep the cornea is and how severe the cornea is preoperatively. And also you can note how thin the cornea is. This would not be a case that would be uh, probably great to have an intact segment placed, but we can place the CTAC segment uh, around the cone and you can see very clearly how much flatter the cornea gets almost immediately. And what we see over time is that the epithelium really starts to fill in that inferior portion and you get a really smooth contour. And if we look at the Scheinflug images, so this was a patient uh, who had his intact segment removed by us and then a CTAC segment placed instead. And you can see that the intact segments elevate the cornea, but they leave an elevation in the periphery, um, whereas the CTAC segments still elevate the cornea and create flattening inside of the segment. But the corneal contour, the corneal curvature in the periphery remains relatively unchanged. And that's true for the thicker CTAC segments and also true for the thinner ones. And this can be particularly helpful when it comes to contact lens fitting, because one of the biggest complaints we get about contact lens fitting after intacts is that uh, the fitting can be more difficult and sometimes can create problems for the intact segment, because not only do you have to now clear the cone area of the cornea, which sometimes is not flat, significantly flatter, um, but also you now have to clear the peripheral elevation uh, of the segment itself, uh, which can be more difficult. With the CTAC segment, because it maintains the peripheral curvature of the cornea, the fitting of a contact lens is very, very similar to uh, any keratoconic patient that you would have treated before and can be a lot easier. So again, as I said, their excitement is really surrounded around the fact that we can get so much more flattening with these CTAC segments. We had looked into our intact segments that we placed and found that, of course, as they were thicker, we expected to see more flattening, which we did, but the most flattening we saw on average was about nine diopters. With the CTAC segment, we're seeing about 13 diopters. And what's particularly exciting is the really spectrum of flattening that we're seeing. We can flatten a patient's cornea by four diopters, we can flatten another patient's cornea by 20 diopters or anywhere in between. And this really gives us a level of customization to keratoconus treatment that we never had before. And we can combine CTAC and topography guided PRK and use them in conjunction to further improve patient's topography. So in this case, we placed the CTAC segment, we made the, cent the cone much smaller, much flatter centrally, and then we performed topography guided PRK and you can see how much more, how much flatter and how much more regular the central portion of the cornea has become. 
And if we look at the difference map from before to after, you can see that we created a much more regular and much flatter uh, central cornea, and this can improve patients' vision significantly. We're looking forward uh, to uh, reporting on and publishing a prospective trial that we just completed uh, for uh, CTAC segments, uh, where we'll, we'll show some of the visual acuity data uh, and some of the topography changes as well, um, which we're, we're really excited about. And then finally, once we have stabilized the cornea, once we've improved uh, corneal curvature, we then look to uh, achieve our main goal, which is to improve patient's vision. And more and more, we can combine uh, a lot of these treatments to give patients a, a different ability to use both glasses and maybe contact lenses in a way they never did before. And that, that's really changed in our management of keratoconus because what we've seen over time for keratoconic patients is that they're the same as everybody else. And over time, they have more and more difficulty wearing their lenses for the 12, 14, 16 hours a day that they're used to. And the more that we can uh, give patients functional vision and glasses, even if it's not their best vision, the more we can really improve their quality of life. Because if we can take a patient and allow them to wear their glass, their contact lenses for let's say eight hours a day, but come home and put on glasses and function, they can not only extend their use of lenses uh, long term, but they can really uh, change their entire uh, quality of life. And I wanted to kind of finish up showing two different cases of how we've integrated this modern management into our clinic. So this was a 19-year-old who we saw uh, in our clinic uh, with keratoconus in both eyes, and he had already come to us having had cross-linking in both eyes. Unfortunately, he had had an injury to his cornea as a child, and he was amblyopic with a corneal scar in the right eye. So he was very dependent on his left eye. He was in college uh, studying uh, many hours. Um, and his biggest complaint was really that he couldn't wear his lens for more than eight hours a day, which is not an infrequent uh, complaint that we hear. And we can see why this is a big problem for him, because if we look at his uh, spectacle correction, he's about 2070 in the left eye. And his contact lens correction is very, very uh, adequate, um, but he can't function if he doesn't wear his lens. So this was his uh, pre-op corneal topography, and you can see that this is a sort of severe, moderately uh, severe uh, keratoconus. His uh, maximum keratometry is about 61 diopters. And so we placed a CTAC segment for him. And again, if you focus in on the three-month result, you can see the consistency of a lot of the results that we're getting, that despite the size or uh, curvature of your cornea or the cone, we're able to get this regular, uh, flatter central cornea uh, by placing these CTAC segments. And we were able to improve his uncorrected vision to 2050, which was fantastic. But really, it's his spectacle correction uh, that was most impressive. His spectacle correction improved to about 2030, even getting some 2025 letters with a much smaller refraction, a much more manageable refraction. And even his contact lens vision actually improved a little bit afterwards. So for this 19-year-old, having this type of a treatment really changed his life because he still wears contact lenses all day. He still wears the contact lenses to go to school, but he can take out the lenses. He can wear glasses uh, during the, at night or even to study, um, and this has changed his entire life. And the last case I wanted to show kind of also is a nice synopsis of how we're using multiple modalities to now help patients meet their needs. And so this was a 33-year-old patient who we saw. Now, he had had a history of intacts that, and cross-linking that was done in 2010 in his right eye and cross-linking uh, alone that was done in 2013 in his left eye. But uh, unfortunately, uh, even though he had the intact segment placed, uh, he really still was dependent on wearing a contact lens in his uh, right eye, uh, and he was uh, didn't really notice much of a difference from having the treatment done. Whereas in his left eye, he's not wearing anything. Um, his vision is not perfect, but to him, it's uh, it's good. And his uncorrected vision is 2030. His best uh, spectacle and contact lens grip. Uh, vision was the same, uh, which is why he really wasn't wearing the lens in the left eye at all. So he was only wearing a scleral lens in the right eye. And glasses would probably not be very effective 
for him because his vision is so different and also he's very anisometropic. So for him, we did topography guided PRK initially to uh, flat over his intact segments uh, to uh, continue to flatten and make the central cornea more regular. And we uh, achieved that result. We uh, improved his uncorrected vision uh, mildly, but we were able to improve his spectacle correction uh, from 2050 to 2025. He was now no longer uh, wearing a contact lens in that eye, uh, but he was still pretty anisometropic. Uh, he was still uh, had a reasonable amount of astigmatism and myopia, uh, whereas the other eye had a mixed astigmatism. So in his case, we now have stabilized his cornea, we improved his corneal topography, and now we're looking to improve his vision and make his uh, eyes less anisometropic. So for him, uh, since he had good spectacle correction, we offered to place a ICL from uh, Vizium, the implantable columnar lens. And we replaced a toric ICL, uh, which sits in the sulcus uh, for this patient. And you can see uh, the full effect now. So his uncorrected vision is now 2030. His best spectacle corrected vision is 2025. And his refraction is uh, significantly improved. So now if we look at his right and his left eye, we were really able to meet his needs. His eyes are much more balanced in his uncorrected vision. His uh, spectral correction is mild and more balanced, and if he chooses, he can wear glasses uh, to get that full correction. So overall, uh, advanced diagnostics are really critical uh, because we must diagnose keratoconus early. We must be able to treat it early, particularly to stabilize the cornea so that we can offer patients the opportunity for these other treatments that are available. Early cross-linking is critical to stabilize the cornea. But as we saw, regular follow-up is really key, especially in those patients who have ectasia after refractive surgery, because uh, at least a significant minority of them will require a repeat cross-linking at some point. And once we've stabilized the cornea, we have so many new uh, things available to us, particularly topography-guided PRK, and really, very excitingly, soon these corneal tissue inlays uh, to be able to improve patients' topography uh, and improve their vision. So uh, thank you very much. Again, thank you to Oculus for inviting me to give this talk tonight. Um, and now I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, Steve, what a, what a plethora of information. Amazing uh, talk. Thank you so much. Um, and we do have some really good questions, and I have some myself. I'd like to just spend a couple more minutes if you can hang out. Sure. Um, all right, let's start off with a question about keratoconic patients and eventual cataract surgery. Um, so one of the questions said is, um, what would be a red flag um, when considering the type of IOL, like an EDOF or a multifocal IOL or even a toric IOL? What do you look at on these keratoconic patients when it's time to consider IOL surgery? It's a, it's a really good question. And it's an, it's an evolving question because of some of the modalities that we talked about tonight. Um, I think the most important thing is their, uh, at least historical, uh, correction and their goals. So those are the first two things that we always talk about with every keratoconic patient. Number one, I want to know what their goals are, um, which, you know, do they care about can their current contact lens wear? Um, do they want to be, you know, relatively glasses free? What, what are their goals? Um, and then how have they historically corrected their vision? The patients who have obviously been correcting their vision with some form of specialty contact lens are the ones that I am the most hesitant uh, to offer any kind of multifocal lens or extended depth of focus lens for, um, because adding further aberration into the eye of an already aberrated cornea um, is just likely to be a recipe for uh, an unhappy patient. So um, if their corneas, if they're very, very mild, um, and I have a very, very uh, high threshold to be able to put a, a multifocal or an extended depth of focus lens in any keratoconic patient. I, I, I very rarely um, would, would consider doing it. But toric lenses can be very, very helpful, um, but they need to have a very regular astigmatism and they need to be at least historically been able to correct their vision, I think, in, in glasses to some reasonable um, extent, uh, which is sometimes hard to determine with, with uh, cataract patients uh, because obviously when they're coming to you, they can't 
The other thing which is important is that now we can use topography guided PRK, we can use corneal inlays to improve patients' topography before their cataract surgery. And that has created a whole new uh, group of patients who are not candidates for toric lenses uh, or not candidates to be uh, have spectacle or spectacle independence who are now having remarkable cataract results. Uh, the one caveat to that is it takes a long time to get there because you have to do the surgery to correct the topography. Age procedures, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just a comment uh, along the same question. What, are there any individual indices or metrics you look at? Do you look at just total high, high order aberrations? Do you look at cord mu? What are the things that you look at um, to try to decide which direction you might go in with the IOL? Well, I mean, you, you look at the same things that you would look at for in general for, uh, for multifocality, which is uh, high order aberrations, specifically uh, spherical and coma. Um, of the cord mu, um, but uh, in these patients, uh, you know, again, when it comes to multifocality um, or extended depth of focus, um, I would really be very hesitant uh, to be putting that in unless those values were essentially normal. So if those values were the same, you know, values that we use uh, to, for, you know, kind of general multifocal lenses, I, that would be maybe the only area I would consider it. For toric, I don't think that obviously those values matter as much. It's much more about how regular the astigmatism is and how much the astigmatism, the vertex lines up uh, of the cornea, um, and where you know that that they're that the astigmatism is regular and, and essentially over the pupil. Those are really uh, the key metrics to be confident that a toric lens um, is going to uh, work well. And same thing with the toric ICL. We have a question about efficacy of cross-linking. In the example that was asked, in a patient where they exhibit changes primarily in the posterior cornea, PRC versus the anterior cornea, do they benefit as much from stabilization with cross-linking than patients that have both anterior and posterior changes? It's a, it's a good question. I don't think we've looked at that uh, specifically. I mean, I think the changes in the posterior curvature are indicative that we, that down the road, there is going to be changes in the anterior curvature. But again, this is where clinical, some of the clinical decision-making has to be on an individual basis. So if I have somebody who is maybe in their later 30s or 40s, and we know that their cornea is probably stiffer and somewhat more stable just by age, and they have mild change in their posterior surface, I would consider uh, watching that and watching it closely, but watching it to see whether or not it's changing. But if I have a younger patient in their teens, which is exhibiting change in their posterior surface, I'm extremely worried that that change is eventually going to be on their anterior surface, where it's going to be much more visually significant. And so I do think that cross-linking, which is not going to have really as much effect on the posterior surface, but is going to stiffen the anterior surface, will hopefully prevent that change from happening. Uh, we have not specifically looked into that. It's, it's a good question. It's something that we probably should look into in our, in our data. Excellent. Um, our next question is regarding CTAC. Um, so since keratoconus is progressive, do you think that CTACs may need to be repeated if the pathology continues to advance? Or do you think that there's any, um, any effect on slowing the progression with CTACs? Or is it really just a compensation and you may have to do more treatment of either either a different type of treatment or CTACs again. Um, so what, what do you think the effect CTEC has on the disease process or, or, or the, the history of the disease? Right, so we, I mean, the short answer is we don't know, obviously, uh, at this point. Um, you know, right now our CTACs, our patients are having cross-linking done as well. So uh, we are doing it, uh, we've started to do it actually combined uh, in certain cases. So we've started to do a CTAC and cross-linking on the same day. In our clinical trial, we only did CTAC alone, um, but our, those patients most have already had it or they are, about, they are going to have uh, cross-linking done um, uh, afterwards. Um, there is probably some biomechanical uh, change and hopefully some uh, biomechanical improvement for placing the segment, but uh, we don't know enough about that yet to be confident to not do cross-linking in these patients. Um, 
CTAC is reversible. You can remove them and exchange them. So there, theoretically, it would be possible down the road uh, to, um, uh, if a cornea did steepen, to put in a thicker segment or a longer segment uh, to improve the patient's vision. Um, I've exchanged one or two of them where I wanted to get more or less effect, and it was uh, relatively uh, straightforward to, to take the, the segment in and out. Um, but we, you know, over time, time will tell. When you create the channels for CTEC, Steve, is it a different depth or, or anything different than you did back with Intex, or is it really very, the same? Yeah, very, very different. So um, it's a much more anterior placement, which is what, uh, which is what gives it a more profound effect. And we can place them anteriorly because it's corneal tissue. So we're not only placing it, we don't have to worry as much about thickness uh, because of that, but we're also able to place it much closer to the anterior surface, which is what gives such a more, uh, a much more flattening from, from the segment. So I have a question for you, uh, a personal question about um, transepithelial uh, PRK. Um, just in general, obviously one of, one of the many off-label procedures that we perform to help these patients. Um, do you use epithelial mapping to determine your, your strategy with that, or how do you determine um, the refractive effect for the PRK? I mean, because we know the epithelium in a keratoconic typically is thin to the cone. How do you account for that, and like, and how do you just go use a physics laser, and do you do just two pulses per micron, or how, how do you calculate the transepithelial portion of the ablation? Right, so we're, we're doing this on the Alcon platform, on the EX500, that's that's the topography guided uh, software that, that we have. Um, so yes, uh, we are using epithelial mapping, so that is uh, very, very helpful to us. Um, and, uh, you know, the epithelium on a keratoconic patient, uh, as uh, most of us know, uh, is very unique. It's uh, particularly thin over the cone itself and generally thick uh, around the cone, which is what gives some more symmetry uh, to the corneal curvature uh, uh, for a keratoconic patient. And we actually learned a lot about this from cross-linking uh, when we saw that the corneas were steepening after cross-linking and it, it turned out to be uh, more of an epithelial effect in the first month and then it would flatten uh, afterwards. So that pattern is actually very, very helpful to us because uh, what we want to do is we want to flatten as much as we can over the cone. And we actually want to limit some of the steepening in the periphery because otherwise you get these uh, large myopic shifts in these patients. And by uh, getting, by the laser essentially ablating through the epithelium over the cone first, we're actually getting exactly what we want, which is more effect over the cone uh, than anywhere else in the cornea. And that's how we get those big uh, flattenings, those big uh, changes that I showed in one of the slides, even though that's a transepithelial uh, ablation. For refractive effect, we're calculating it uh, based off of the epithelial maps and then based off of the ablation depths um, and, and trying to determine uh, between all of that uh, how much we think the refractions are going to change. But it's it's difficult. The one thing I would say for these patients is that a lot of these patients are not undergoing, the more moderate patients who are having this done are not undergoing this treatment to be spectacle independent. And that's a very important difference from typical PRK. Right. Um, these patients are undergoing the treatment to either have better glasses vision um, or uh, be able to potentially wear soft contact lenses. Um, and so, it's a different uh, calculation that you're making for them. You do have to hit the target so that they're not very anisometropic, and that's really critical. Um, but you expect and you tell them that they're going to wear glasses when this is done. You're hoping that their glasses vision is better. Excellent. Yeah, I know it's always been a challenge with the Al Alcon platform because there isn't a PTK software in the U.S. to do a, a, a planar ablation. So the math becomes really difficult. Um, yes, but, but the math, the math but, the, but the key is the math is very difficult, especially on patients that you want to uh, be spectacle independent. Right. So um, you, this, you've got that you're leeway. You're doing the math, but if you're half, you know, or 0.75 off, and but they have good correction in their glasses, for a lot of these patients, that's our goal. All right. Our last question. It's an interesting question, and it, and it, it gets to, I think, back 20 years ago when we would have done a talk like this, you would have talked. We didn't have cross-linking. We didn't have the only treatment we had was corneal transplants. 
and it's probably the only thing you didn't mention tonight was corneal transplants. Um, does it play? Does corneal transplants of any type play any role in your management of keratoconus anymore, or is it pretty much relegated for the absolute last option? Yeah. So I, I usually so corneal transplants to me at this point, from in most cases, um, are for scarring. Um, in most cases now, especially CTEC has really changed the game. Um, it, for most cases, uh, we have between the advancements of specialty contact lenses and particularly uh, scleral lenses and impression-based scleral lenses, um, there are very few corneas that we can't fit with a scleral lens anymore. And between CTAC and topography guided PRK, um, and uh, we are able to really uh, create a more regular topography in much more advanced cases than we ever anticipated. But the one thing that it still holds true is that if you have a significant scar in your cornea, then no matter what we do with a CTAC segment, no matter what we do with a scleral lens, you're still not going to be able uh, to get adequate vision. So primarily the cases that I now do transplant for are patients who have a scarring that we cannot correct. And do you have a preferred methodology of transplant? I mean, do you do full for I, the, 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 the preference is to do is to do dog um, yeah. if we can, especially on these younger patients. Um, and so uh, we we primarily uh, try to do a uh, dog for these patients. Uh, you know, some depending on high drop scarring and some other things. Um, you know, may not may not be the best candidates for it. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us tonight, Steve. This was a great talk. I learned quite a bit. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thanks again, Steve. Great job. And thanks everyone for attending and have a great evening. Have a good night. Thank you for having me.